Our first speaker after lunch is Max. Max is known from Style Components, React Boilerplate, Spectrum Chat, or speaking at AgentConf. I'm always thinking about my own product. And in that time, Max releases another one. Last week, he successfully launched CraftCDN. Now listen to him and enjoy his talk. Hey, my name is Max Stoiber and I am super excited to be here today and talk about how I answered one of maybe life's hardest questions, which is what do I want to do with it? <laughs> what do I want to spend my life doing? To give you a little bit of context of where the situation came from and why I asked myself this question apart from general existential dread after pandemic and stuff. We'll take that into account. But of course, there's a lot of context to this question that I have to talk about first before I can tell you about how I approached it. I want to start my story from Spectrum. Back in 2017, at the beginning of 2017, I co-founded a startup with uh, two of my friends from San Francisco, Brian Lovin and Bryn Jackson, and we built Spectrum, which was this um, community platform, basically. It was like a modern forum in very simple terms. Uh, we, of course, had more fancy terms, but really it was a more modern forum for communities to hang out in. And Spectrum went, uh, quite well we built that for one and a half years but also whenever you found something yourself it's sort of a lot of up and down and if i were to chart what it was what it felt like to me to found spectrum it would look something like this um very wavy definitely some red parts that are that were less great but also a lot of green spikes where things went really well the the way i describe what it feels like to found a startup to my friends who don't work in the tech industry and have no idea what that even means is I say it's sort of like surfing a little bit. You're in the water trying to catch a wave. You're trying to get that initial traction. You're trying to get the first people to use the thing you think is great. And it takes a while and you're just like paddling around waiting for the swell to come and then eventually it comes. And you start paddling, 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 and the wave picks you up and brings you along. And suddenly you're on top of your surfboard and you're surfing and you're feeling fantastic. Everything is going super well. You're up there, you're doing your thing, you're, you're in the flow, everything's going super well. And then suddenly the wave comes and sweeps you over and it just smashes you face down right into the ocean. You are under the water. You can barely catch your breath. You're... You're, you feel like you're kind of dying. There's water everywhere. You're trying your best to orient yourself. Where the hell are we even? How do I get out of here? I want to get out of this water. I want to breathe again. And then you get back out. You sort of take a step back. You relax a little bit. You take a deep breath, find your surfboard, and you paddle back out and do the, do the whole thing again. Now, described like that, either that sounds terrible to you or that sounds great to you, right? Depending on if you enjoy surfing or not. But I think emotionally, that's really what it feels like to found a startup. It is these constant waves of up and downs and the highs are very high, but the lows can be very, very low. And that's just the way startups go, right? Nothing that you're ever going to found is going to be a straight line up and to the right. That just doesn't exist, right? It's always these waves. And a lot of what I learned during that time is how to manage these waves, because in reality, they are what kills startups, right? One little downturn, one little low can really break your spirits and it can really break your momentum. And that basically kills you. Um, and that can happen very quickly in startups. If you have a bad time, like we had in the middle there, in the red, red area, I made that red because we had a memory leak in our backend servers and our servers would crash at the beginning once every day, but because of our growth, it eventually became once every hour. And I was the main technical person at Spectrum and I couldn't figure out why the memory leaks were happening. And it was a really bad time for me because I was just constantly under stress to figure out this huge issue that we were having 
And I just couldn't, I, I didn't know what the solution was. And it took me two months to figure out the solution and finally solve the problem. And, and uh, then everything went, went well again. Now, overall, the one and a half or two years that we built Spectrum, I would say overall, they were an 11 out of 10 experience. Yes, there were a lot of up and downs and it was sort of an emotional challenge to manage them. But I was also the happiest I've ever been. I'd never been that in charge of my own destiny before. And that comes with a lot of responsibility. That comes with a lot of pressure to do the right thing and to succeed. Because if I don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for me. But I love that. And I really enjoyed founding Spectrum. Eventually, GitHub acquired Spectrum. Um, and Bryn, Brian, and I, we were still just the three of us. We joined GitHub to integrate what Spectrum was, essentially a modern forum, into GitHub. Now, if I were to chart what it felt like to work at GitHub, it would look something like this. As you can tell, there isn't a lot of red, which is good, but there also isn't a lot of green, which is not so good. Um, working at GitHub for me personally was fine. Right, it was a nice job. The people there are great. I had great a great team. I had a great coworkers. I had a fantastic manager. Um, I was working on stuff I was relatively passionate about. I had a lot of flexibility in my life. I was paid well. I could build something for hundreds of millions of developers, but still, it was fine because I didn't feel like I owned anything. Like I, whatever I did, didn't doesn't didn't meaningfully contribute to GitHub's success, right? GitHub is a success. I can neither influence that and make it more of a success really, nor can I destroy that success. So there, there isn't any responsibility, but it was still a fun experience to work there because working on something that I use every single day is, is really cool and something that I, that, I, that I cherish a lot. Overall, I would say working at GitHub was sort of like a five out of 10 experience. It was fine. It wasn't bad. Like there weren't any very bad parts, but it also wasn't great. It wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. And so after, after again, another year and a half or so of, of GitHub, I said, meh, this is kind of just fine. Like I would rather do something else and found just by true pure chance, a new job at a startup again called Gatsby. If you're in the react ecosystem, you might know Gatsby as the static site generator. Um, and I joined Gatsby to work on a bunch of R&D projects and uh, for a little while there, life was great again. I was at a startup again. I had a lot of responsibility on my shoulders. I was still working with a great team and there weren't like any existential troubles, like we weren't going to die at any moment. Um, and I was working on cool stuff. Uh, I, I really like Gatsby as a framework. I really like Gatsby. Um, the, the people that I worked with there, my, my coworkers were fantastic. And then after a year there, I looked at, I looked at sort of reflected on what it felt like to work there and came up with a graph that looks something like this. This looks remarkably similar to the GitHub one, right? Nothing particularly terrible. Like there's no red parts. There's, there's nothing that's really, really, really bad, but also not a lot of green parts, right? Not a lot of this, um, these really high highs. It was just fine again. And I would say on balance, it was slightly more enjoyable to me than working at GitHub because I had more influence and more responsibility. And it was just a young startup and there was a lot to do, but it was still fine. You know, it was a six out of 10. It was a slight improvement, I would say, but it still wasn't really what made me happy. And it was just fine. And, and really after a year I was like, okay, this is fine, but how, how do I get back to an 11 out of 10 experience? How do I get back to that state of real contentment with, with what I'm doing every single day? Really, what do I want in life? How, how do I even figure this out, right? Like, how do I even figure out what the hell I want in life? Um, and so I went to my coach and I discussed it with him. I said, hey, look, I, I'm not, this isn't it. Like, how can I figure out what I want? And he basically told me that I should ask myself the question, what do I actually value? 
Now, the next slide is, is not one that I ever thought I would share publicly. Um, at the time when my coach asked me this, I sat down and I had a really, really honest conversation with myself about what do I actually value, but also what do I not value? What do I care about? And what do I really not care about? And it was extremely difficult because it required being very honest with myself, despite sort of social pressure to say or do certain things. And you'll know what I mean. Um, now, again, I did not expect to share this note publicly. This is literally the note I wrote at the time based on just sitting there and thinking about what do I value? Um, it's written by me for me and it's very rough. So don't expect this to make a lot of sense for you or, or, or your situation. This is very personal to me, but I realized I have to share this because otherwise this whole presentation doesn't make any sense because you're not going to understand why I made the choice that I made. So without further ado, here is the list of things I value and the list of things that I don't value. What I realized I really value is connection, responsibility, agency, variety, openness, and prestige. And the things I realized I really don't care about, even though I maybe should, are money and impact. Now, some of these were easier to admit to myself. Some of these were a lot harder to admit to myself. Specifically, the fact that I don't care about impact was pretty hard to admit because impact is very much what you're judged on when you work in a big company. For example, at GitHub and at Gatsby both, the entire promotion process was based on the fact of your impact on the company. And that can be impact to as many people as possible or the biggest impact, however you want to frame that. But it's very much about impact. But I, when, I, when I think about it, I wasn't any happier when I was doing something for 100 billion developers at GitHub than I was making something for a couple hundred users at Spectrum, right? I didn't care about the scale of the impact. I didn't care about sort of how many people does this touch. I cared about does this make anybody's lives better? And at that point, even if it's just one person, I'm content with what I'm doing, right? Particularly if it's my own, like if I have the problem myself, that's the best because then immediately there's at least one person that wants the solution to this problem. And so I did. I don't personally really care about impact. Um, that was hard to admit because it's sort of like a maybe, I don't want to say a red flag, but it's like a, it's something that you have to care about if you want to succeed in corp corporations. And the fact that I value prestige was also very hard to, for me to admit to myself. It's, I guess from the outside, it might be sort of obvious. I have way too many Twitter followers, way more than I'm willing to admit. And a large part of the reason of that is that I like prestige. I like being prestigious. I like being known. I like people respecting me. Even though it sounds vain and, and superficial, it's just the way it is. And that was kind of hard to admit for me as well. I was like, ah, okay, I guess that's the case. And then the others, I love connection. I love people. Um, I love talking to people. I love my family. I love my friends. Uh, I love having a lot of responsibility and weight of my shoulders, but also the agency to do something about it, the freedom to do something about it. I love a lot of variety. I don't like doing just one thing. I want to do a variety of different things in my days. Like I don't, I can't spend every single day doing the exact same thing. I want some variety. And I love openness. I love being transparent with people. I love sharing my thoughts. I love sharing my, my story. I love sharing what I do, which kind of comes with the prestige, but also I love working in public, right? I love doing open source. I love those sorts of things. And when I looked at that list, I took that list and I thought, okay, I'm sort of, I guess my, my two main options here are either I find another job at a big or small company, or I go found another startup. Right? Those are sort of the two main options I'm considering. Like, how do those two options cover that list? How, how do they apply to that list? And when I looked at it, taking a job sort of covers some of these things that I care about um, and a lot of things that I don't care about. So a job, agency at a job is not really given. Like when you work at a big company or even when you work at a smaller company, you don't really have that much choice to do that many different things. You can't just decide, oh, today I feel like doing marketing because you're, you're going to be stepping on the marketing team's toes, right? And, and, and they're going to feel like you're, you're trying to do their job and you're sort of restricted to your lane. I'm an engineer, so I got to do engineering and everything else is sort of outside of my power and other people do that. In terms of openness, there's zero of that in most cases. Gatsby is the exception there, but 
and in usual corporations, you really have no way to be open with the public about what you're doing. And then responsibility, you can have some, but it's not really, it's not like, yes, you can be responsible for some people as a manager, for example, but you can't, you're not really responsible for the success of the company. Like at GitHub, whatever I did wasn't going to meaningfully change the trajectory of GitHub, maybe a little bit, but not. It, 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 it's not going to make or break it, basically. Uh, my, responsibility, my, my responsibility wasn't at that level. And then variety, again, you have to do your job. You can't just do what you feel like. Now, compare that to founding a startup. And I realized very quickly that that actually covers all of the things I care about. And while it doesn't cover the things that I don't care about as well, money and impact, I don't really care about them, right? A startup gives me a lot of connection with my co-founders, but also with my users, potential customers. Um, there's a lot of responsibility, obviously. If I fuck up, nothing happens. If I don't do anything, nothing happens. If I do something wrong, it's wrong. There's a lot of agency. I can do what I feel like is the most important thing to do right now. There's a lot of variety. I have to do everything. And I can be as open and as prestigious as I want. And so it became clear to me that, that actually... I probably want to found another startup because that's probably what's, what's going to make me the most happy. I also talked a lot with friends and I realized that through talking to them, particularly my friends who are not in the tech industry, that I'm in the 0.1%. Now, that sounds kind of stupid, but if you think about it, there's 9 billion people on the planet, give or take. How many people of those actually have the privilege and the ability combined to found a tech startup. Maybe 10 million of those. That seems pretty like a reasonable assumption to me. 10 million is already a lot, um, but that's still only 0.1% of the entire planet, right? And I realized I am in that group. I have the privilege. I grew up in, 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 in the West. I, I, I come from a, compared to sort of the average of the world, a very wealthy background. Um, I have enough money to survive every single day and I can take the time to build something new from scratch. And I am in that 0.1%. Now, the other side of the coin is, what does it mean to fail, right? If I were to go and found that at a start, what does it mean to fail? Think about, you know, Spectrum in some sense failed as a startup, we didn't manage to make any money, so we had to be acquired by GitHub. Um, but even though startup uh, Spectrum failed as a as a company, it really didn't fail to me, right? Because every single day, I did what I love. And yes, there were ups and downs. There's always in life. There's always waves. There's always highs, and there's always lows. But overall, every single day, I got up and I had a purpose in life, and I enjoyed doing what I did. And I enjoyed my life every single day. And I realized founding another startup means I cannot fail. Even if the company goes nowhere, even if nobody cares about what I build or co-found, even if nobody wants it, as long as I enjoy my time doing it, it's all worth it, right? The old stupid saying, <laughs> you only live once, uh, YOLO, it's, it's stupid. But it's true, you do only live once. And so I realized, why would I spend my time doing something that I don't enjoy as much when I could, when I have the, the privilege and the freedom to do what I really enjoy. And so I said, you know what? I'm gonna found another startup. Which of course immediately led to the next question. What, what do I found and with whom? And to try and figure that out, I wrote this sort of like blog post about some of the problems I see in our industry and, and, and how they could maybe be solved. But none of them really resonated with people and they didn't really resonate with me either. Like, yeah, the problems I have, but I wasn't passionate in my, enough to really sit down and solve any of them. But then remember when I said I talked with my friends about this whole thing, about what I want to do and whether I want to found a startup? Well, one of my friends, Andreas Klinger, introduced me to a friend of his, Tim Suchan. He showed me, hey, Tim has built this prototype for a GraphQL CDN, and I think it's really cool. Tim currently still has a job, but he might want to found this. Why don't you talk with him? 
And I talked with Tim and I was like, wow, he had built this prototype of a GraphQL specific CDN. So a, a, a sort of a bunch of data centers all around the world that can cache GraphQL queries at the edge. And so they're super fast for all the users and it reduces a bunch of the traffic on the origin server. And the thing is, we actually had that exact problem at Spectrum. We were using GraphQL at Spectrum and we could barely keep up with our traffic. Remember when I talked about the memory leaks? Um, and this specific thing would have solved a lot of our problems, but it just didn't exist. And I, I, we, we couldn't just go and buy it because it literally didn't exist. And so I was like, wow, this is awesome. Hey, Tim, we had a chat. We hit it off almost immediately. And I very quickly bought tickets to go to Berlin and then uh, hang out with him for a week. And so I flew to Berlin, slept on his couch in his apartment, and we just talked for an entire week, right? About, again, what sort of the same things I just talked about today. What do we value in life each? Uh, where do we come from? What's our background? What's our story? Really getting to know each other very tightly. Um, because if you were going to co-found something, that would mean spending a lot of time together. And so we wanted to make sure that we were very aligned on the important things that we were going to do. And as it turns out, after a week, we were like, this is great. We're very aligned on our core values. We're very aligned on where we want to go on our ambitions. And we both really love solving this problem. We love GraphQL, but we know there's trouble when running it in production and we want to help people make that easier. And so we decided to co-found GraphCDN. Now, let me give you a quick demo of GraphCDN. This is what GraphCDN, the dashboard looks like. Here I have created a service for the GitHub GraphQL API and I'm fetching a repository called Cycle.js Counter. Now, this is a cache miss and the GitHub GraphQL API took about 600 milliseconds to send us that data. Now it's cached at the GraphCDN edge and no matter how often I query that data, it'll always be served from the GraphCDN edge. In this case, because I'm in Berlin in about 70 milliseconds, in Vienna it's about 30 milliseconds. It depends on your distance to our nearest data center. Now, the really cool part about GraphCDN is the purging. I can, when I now run an update repository mutation and put in a new description for this repository, um, just something that's slightly different, a simple counter in cycle.js, and I run that mutation, GraphCDN sees that this repository has changed and updates and purges any query globally that contains that repository. And what you can see now is this was a cache miss, and that means it went back to the GitHub servers, the GitHub API, and loaded the new data and got the fresh description and cached it again at the edge. And so that means GraphCDN can actually cache a lot more APIs than any other API caching layer can do because we're very tightly aware of when data changes and can very efficiently invalidate any cached query results that contain that stale data, which is really cool. So to sort of summarize how I decided what I want to do with my life, I got an outside perspective from people that know me well that I spent a lot of time with. I had a difficult but honest conversation with myself about what I really deeply value in life based on historic data, not just what I think I should value in life, but really when I look at my life, what does it look like I really value? And really a little bit of YOLO, you know, a, a little bit of, look, I only, I'm only gonna do this whole thing once. I might as well spend it doing something that I really enjoy. And so what I decided to do with my life is graph CDN. If you have a GraphQL API and you have performance problems, either because your server gets too much traffic or because you want your users to have a way faster user experience, come and talk to me. And I hope this gave you a little bit of inspiration for your own life and how you can approach figuring out what you want to do with your life. I'm Max. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a great day.